What's up, AP World folks? All right, so I noticed a lot of you reflected today that you just wish you had some help with the reading guides, that you get that they're important, but they suck. And so I thought I'd maybe help you out. So I'm looking at your homework that's due. So it's chapter 22, part two, looking at European conquest. So the question says, why were the Spanish able to conquer the Philippines and Indonesia? And I give you the page numbers, 493 to 494. Okay, use those page numbers to help guide where you're going. So in the book, here we are, this is 493. You can tell that it's about conquest. And so these two paragraphs here are the ones that we're looking at. Now, I'm not going to read everything to you. But one of the strategies I'd really encourage you to do is to try to translate the words as you're reading so that they actually make friggin' sense, right? You don't want to just read you know, words that have no meaning and then they're just kind of like hitting you and bouncing off, right? Really try to like dig in. So as I read this, right, so here's the same part, the same passage that you're you're looking at. It says, the following voyages of exploration to the Western Hemisphere, Europeans conquered indigenous people. They conquered the locals. They built territorial empires, established colonies, settled by European migrants, so they set up new places controlled by Europeans. In the Eastern Hemisphere, however, they were mostly unable to force their will on large Asian populations, which had centralized states. So in the Americas, small, depopulized by disease, but in Asia, big populations, big, strong countries, usually. With the decline of the Portuguese effort to control shipping in the Indian Ocean, Europeans mostly traded peacefully in Asian waters alongside the Arabs, Indians, Malay, and Chinese merchants. However, and now here's question one. Dun, 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 dun. Yet, in two island regions of Southeast Asia, the Philippines and Indonesia, Europeans conquered existing authorities. And so our question is, why, why were they able to do that? And so here's our here's our answer. Though densely populated, neither the Philippines nor Indonesia had a powerful state when Europeans arrived. So neither of these two places, the Philippines or Indonesia, was, were powerful places. Nor did imperial authorities in China or India lay claim to these regions. So China hadn't developed them. India hadn't developed them. The local people hadn't really developed. They were underdeveloped, relatively limited in their power and population. And then we get one more little bonus here. Heavily armed ships enabled Europeans to bring force and force those people then under their submission. So what were the, why were the Spanish able to conquer the Philippines and Indonesia? And we could just say there were no major empires or states there. And the Europeans had superior technology. I'm just going to put like your naval weapons is really the major focus. So there you go. There's one done. And so the next one says, explain how the Philippines represent each of the motives of gold, God, and glory. And that's on the next page. So if I scroll down, notice like, all right, man, there's a lot. There's a lot on these pages. Like it's easy to look and go, oh my God, there's so many words. But probably, right, they're going to go in order and they're probably organized by either paragraphs or bold words. And so this first one, interestingly, is going to be glory. And then this next paragraph is going to give us a hint of gold. And then finally, this top paragraph on 494 is going to give us God, right? So as long as you don't allow yourself to get overwhelmed, you should just be able to kind of like logically break this into some parts. So let's do this next part together. And I'm just going to highlight some key parts. So again, I'm going to try to translate. Don't allow yourself to get overwhelmed by big names, right? So if you're looking and going like, I don't even know how to pronounce this, then just call him Miguel, right? If it's somebody really important, we'll talk about him in class or you can ask questions for the sake of reading, just simplify, right? So we're looking at the Philippines. Spanish forces approached the Philippines in 1565 under the command of Miguel Lopez de la Cazbi. It's just Miguel, who named the islands after King Philip II of Spain. 
That, to me, sounds like glory. They're naming it after their king. They're trying to promote or propagandize to the world. Look at how great we are. These islands are named after our king. So, for glory, named the islands after King Philip II of Spain. Whatever. Right, so there's one. Notice, though, I'm always still trying to give a specific fact. I didn't just say, like, Glory named him after some guy. Philippines, Philip, they named it after King Philip II. All right, now we got to find gold and we got to find glory. So back into it. All right, so the next part talks about Manila. Very important. We're going to talk about it again in class. We've already talked about it. We'll talk about it more. So the Spanish policy in the Philippines revolved around trade and Christianity gold and God. So Manila soon emerged as a bustling multicultural port, entrepreneur for trade, particularly in silk. And it quickly became the hub of Spanish commercial activity in Asia. So there we go. There's our gold, right? So China supplies silk. Spain brings silver from the New World on these Manila galleons, and so there's the trade-off. American silver, Chinese silk being exchanged in Manila, that's gold. So let's not overthink it. So what's our proof of gold? Spain uses New World silver to purchase Chinese silver in Manila. Good. There's cool stuff. They have Manila galleons, which are big boats transporting it. And they talk about how there was a lot of conflict, but that doesn't help us with the question. The question, how do we see gold? We see gold because Spain is using silver to buy cool stuff. Last one, we're looking at God. <clears throat> All right. Apart from a promoting trade, Spanish authorities in the Philippines sought to spread Roman Catholicism throughout the archipelago. Spanish rulers and missionaries pressured predominant Filipinos to convert to Christianity in hopes of persuading others to follow their example. They opened schools to teach fundamentals of Christian doctrine, along with basic literacy in densely populated regions of the island. Missionaries countered stiff resistance in the highlands. Spanish authority was not as strong as on the coasts, and it drew opposition. Overall, long-term Filipinos did turned increasingly to Christianity. And by the 19th century, the Philippines had become a fervent Roman Catholic place. So done. Again, we're not going to spend too much time. So for God, Catholic schools taught literacy and Christian teachings. Slow, but eventually successful. Oops, a little typo because I'm trying too hard. So there you go, right? I'm just trying to move quickly through each of the topics. And so there we go. Eight and nine are done. And so now we're moving on to some of the other questions here. So what was the Dutch strategy for Java and the Spice Islands? How well did it work? Well, look, the next one is the conquest of Java. So notice how it just kind of follows big idea to the next big idea to the next big idea. So how did the Dutch do it? They imposed their they imposed their rule on their islands, but they didn't seek converts. So they want authority. They don't want to force religion. And so what did they do? They concentrated instead on the trade of spices, cloves, nutmegs, mace. There's this guy, Vian, blah, 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 in 1619. He founded Batavia on the island of Java. That's all extra, okay? But what I do notice is major goal in controlling trade. They want spices. The VOC is the Dutch East India Company. So we've got an East India Company trying to dominate trade, trying to dominate the spice trade. Okay, and so it says Cohen's plan was to establish the Dutch East India Company's monopoly over spice production and trade, thus allowing or enabling Dutch merchants to reap enormous benefits. Cohen brought his naval power to bear on the small islands and forced them to deliver spices only to the VOC. He took advantage of tensions of local princes and extracted concessions in many. So what did he do? 
He benefited from local conflicts, right? He played tribes against each other. He threatened military action to force people to trade with only the Dutch East India Company. Okay, so what was the strategy for them and was it successful? So um, the Dutch used military threats to force tribes to exclusively trade spices like nutmeg and what else? What was it? So we had nutmeg and cloves and mace. So nutmeg and clove to the VOC, the Dutch East India Company. They also started wars between rivals, between rival tribes. Let's go with that. Okay, how well did it work? I, so how well did it work? I, Dutch numbers were too few for them to rule directly over the Southeast Asia. They made alliances with local leaders. Dutch rule in Batavia, the most important spice-bearing islands. All right, so they didn't embark on campaigns. So it's kind of hard to say, oh, here, the monopoly profits from the spice trade not only enriched the VOC, but it made the Netherlands the most prosperous land in Europe at the time. So they started wars between rivals. They formed and formed alliances. And how well did it work? These strategies made the Netherlands the wealthiest nation in Europe and the VOC would be the richest company in history. Think of that. Even even wealthier than Google or Amazon. I mean, like that's insane when you really think about the kind of wealth they have. Okay, so hopefully this helps you go through and find little bits of info. Um, I'm going to take a quick pause and then we'll kind of really just power through the remaining parts. All right. Okay, so questions 11 says describe Russia's strategy for empire and then how was it different from Portugal, Spain, and the Dutch? And then the next question is also connected to Russia and it says, why did Russian explorers venture into Siberia? So pretty straightforward, Russia's strategy for empire was expanding a landed empire, all right? So how were they different from those places? Mainly their empire was on land, not on water. The other, I guess, thing that makes them somewhat unique is they sent these government agents out to like represent the government, but really it was more of a tribute collecting mission. They wanted taxes to be collected from indigenous peoples. Right? They weren't necessarily looking to convert or like Russify every population in the in the territories they conquered. They just wanted furs or they wanted metals. Right? So furs were their top priority. Beaver pelt, caribou pelt, lynx for luxury clothes, hats, coats. Um, and so collecting these taxes from them was slightly different. Now, Spain also was like heavily interested in converting local populations. Right? We just got done talking about how they were using, you know, the Catholic Church to create schools and convert people. Russia really wasn't interested in that, right? They were much more like the Dutch and the fact that like, yeah, they mentioned religion, but it certainly was not a major priority at all. So that's says, why did Russian explorers venture into Siberia? Similar answer, right? They were there for the furs. They wanted to exploit the luxury goods in the area. And then the last couple of questions here is, it says, explain the root cause of European conflict in India. How did Britain and Spanish, I'll say, how did Britain turn Spanish success into British success? Okay, and so the root cause of problems in India, and if we look at it in the book, really the, the, the heart of this is the resources, right? They were fighting for control over who had access to some of the most important trade goods in the region, right? And so what we see is England and France specifically really going after each other in the Seven Years' War. 
sugar, cotton, tea, those were the items in most demand that could be found in India. Specifically, fighting really broke out in a place called Pondicherry between the French and the British there. Um, and so that would be a root cause. How did Britain turn Spanish success into British success? Easy. They stole Spanish things. So the Spanish had tons of silks and silvers and British pirates took those Spanish ships took the cargoes inside and just plain old pinched it. They stole it and brought it back to England, right? So uh, people like Francis Drake, for example, were privateers, people paid for by the British government to go out and raid the wealth of their rivals like the Spanish. And so that brings us to the last point here. We've got all this war, all this conflict, and the most important one is the Seven Years' War. And although there are many allies in it, keep it simple. Britain versus France. And they both had allies. For example, in America, this war was known as the French and Indian War. So you had French and Native Americans versus the British. The Iroquois had switched from England's ally to the French's ally. It's a, it's a huge war. And that's really the enduring impact that this war has. It's the first truly world war. And so the impact that it has on global trade and empires by the end of this war, it will show that England's empire will be massively important. Now, this isn't until the mid 1700s. Okay, so in the 1400s, Portugal's dominant. In the 1500s, Spain with the Spanish New World, they start to become dominant. Meanwhile, in the Eastern Hemisphere, you have the Dutch and the Portuguese kind of fighting it out for control of the Spice Islands. So you got these different kind of areas. By the 1700s, England is going to start exerting its control all around the world, whether stealing Spanish stuff from piracy, whether fighting the French in India or fighting the French in North America. England's empire will be the dominant force by the time we get into the mid-1700s. All right, guys, hopefully this helps, and I'll see you at school.